Hello, everybody. This is Kosh, the station director here at 4FAR. I just wanted to introduce you all to our webinar of the day, Elasmo Branks of the Bahamas. Uh, we're going to get started soon, but we just want to give you all a few minutes just to get situated and get ready for a presentation. So give us a few minutes and hang in there. Hi everyone, this is Alex coming from Four Far Field Station on Andres Island in the Bahamas. This is our second webinar in our series. A little bit about IFS before we get started. IFS is an education-based nonprofit. We are currently at Four Far Field Station where groups come to learn about marine and terrestrial biology and ecology. Today we're going to bring Andres to you and talk about my favorite animal, sharks and rays, otherwise known as elasmobranchs. If you have any questions, ask in our comments and I'll answer them at the end of our presentation.
So elasmobranchs of the Bahamas. First, we're going to go through a little bit of elasmobranchs in general, and then we'll talk about the anatomy and then species. So to start the taxonomic classification of elasmobranchs, they are in the kingdom Annelida. They are also in the phylum Chordata, and then they're in the class Chondrichthyes. So Chondrichthyes are what we are going to focus on today for the most part. We'll talk about Chondrichthyes afterwards, but Chondrichthyes in the main sense just means that they have cartilage uh, for a skeleton instead of bone. Our subclasses are elasmobranchi, or elasmobranchs, as I said earlier. Elasmobranchs have no swim bladders and have five to seven pairs of gill clefts openings. The other subclass that we won't focus on today, but still important to mention, is heliocephaly. Um, heliocephaly um, is another kind of cartilaginous fish. Um, all orders uh, in this are extinct except for chamophores or chimeras. Uh, in the bottom here, um, the thing that isn't a shark or a ray is a ratfish or a goat fish, uh, ghost fish. So the class chondrichthyes is what we're going to focus on for today. Uh, as I said earlier, they have a cartilaginous skeleton, um, and they are jawed vertebrae with pair fins, paired snares, scales, uh, and a heart with its chambers. They have five to seven gill slits per side. Uh, so you can kind of see the gill slits on the side of that shark there. Um, most sharks just have five gill slits. Um, the sharks that have seven gill slits are things like the seven gill um, shark. Surprise, surprise. They also have dermal denticles, which is a really special kind of thing about them. Dermal denticles um, all differentiate depending on the shark. So you can see on the bottom there, we have three different kinds of sharks. In the middle, there's that hammerhead shark, and it's really pointed um, and streamlined. And then next to it on the right is a nurse shark, and it's really smooth and not as pointy. The reason for this is because a hammerhead needs to swim a little bit faster in comparison to nurse sharks who usually just stay on the bottom. And these dermal denticles are actually really sharp. So if you were to pet a shark backwards, it would actually cut your skin. So Another name that they have for dermal denticles are tiny teeth skin. And then chondrichthyes also have ampullae of Lorenzini, which we will talk about in our next slide. Ampullae of Lorenzini, um, you can kind of see them on the snout of that shark there. There are a bunch of little pores at the shark's nose, and it's their sixth sense. So the ampullae of Lorenzini. These ampullae of Lorenzini um, again, as I said, is their sixth sense. We have our five senses, and a shark is really special and has a sixth sense. Um, and they are thousands of little pores on their snout. Um, they kind of look like tiny little blackheads, but they're these jelly-filled pores um, that connect to nerve endings. And they use these to be able to navigate and to find prey. So they're electroreceptors, um, and they use it for navigation. So they can detect where magnetic north is, uh, so when they are navigating uh, or migrating, they can navigate where they are going in a way. And then they can also find prey. So any live animal um, is going to set off some sensors for the shark to know that there's something live that is around them. Deep sea sharks actually have really large pores of ampullae of Lorenzini. And this is because you can't really see at the bottom of the ocean as well as you can when there's daylight. Uh, so it compensates for poor visibility. Additional characteristics of our chondrichthyes is countershading. So countershading is when fish have two different colors to them. So on the top, they're a lot darker than they are on the bottom. This is so that they can blend into the ocean a little bit better. So if a predator was to look on top, they would kind of blend in with that dark water. Meanwhile, if you were to look at from the bottom at the shark's belly, they would also blend in because of that um, light that's coming in from the top of the ocean and that stark white belly. If they were flipped upside down, it'd be really obvious to tell uh, where the shark was from the top or even from the bottom. 
They also have no swim bladder. So most fish have a swim bladder and this is so that they can maintain buoyancy. Sharks instead maintain buoyancy with a really large liver that is really rich in oil. This acts as a nutrient when food is scarce um, and deep sea sharks livers can actually be 20% of their total weight. Um, this also helps so that sharks can move really fast in between different pressure zones in the water. If you've ever been diving, then you know a bit about pressure. Um, and it can do a lot to your body. And sharks don't have as much of an effect to the pressure because of their swim bladder. They are also isotonic to their environment. This just means that they are able to balance the salinity that is in the water in comparison to their body. Um, they have a really high urea, which is a nitrogen compound content in their tissue, um, and it carries nitrogen out of their body in their urine. Um, so this is why most sharks can't go into fresh water or they will lose body regulation. Uh, the one except, exception to this is bull sharks. They can actually change their kidney function to excrete large amounts of urea, which is pretty cool. They also have two different kinds of ways that they are able to bring oxygen into their bodies. Uh, so they bring oxygen in through their gill slits through the water. Um, and two ways are through buccal pumping or ram ventilation. The buccal pumping method is for mostly for sharks who are just laying on the bottom. So something a shark like your nurse shark is going to mainly use this function. They are able just to pull in their water through their gill slits so that they can take in that oxygen that they need. Ram ventilation, on the other hand, you need to be swimming the whole time to be able to actually ram that water in through your gill slits. The great white shark is only able to use ram ventilation to get oxygen into their gill slits. They do not have the blue valve pumping. So if they were to actually start stop swimming, they would suffocate, um, which is why they're swimming all the time. Sharks also, lastly, have he hectorosyral uh, tails. So this just means that their um, spine extends all the way to the tip of their caudal tail. Like you can see in this photo here, this just makes it so they have a really strong tail and are able to propel themselves through the water. Before we get into our species, we're going to talk about reproduction. Uh, firstly, is something really important to note is that sharks usually have a long gestation period, rates of maturity, and low birth numbers. Um, so it takes a while for them to grow their pups. Um, the rates of maturity just means that it takes a while for them to uh, mature sexually. And then they also have low birth numbers. Some sharks that we'll talk about today seem to have high birth numbers, but in comparison to a lot of other fish, it's not as high. So you can see that shark there um, has that really round belly, which means that she's pregnant with some baby sharks. Males have claspers. So if you want to be able to tell the gender of a shark, um, it's really easy to tell. Boys have these claspers. Um, and they have a set of two. And the reason for this is just to make reproduction a little bit easier. They only use one at a time. And then lastly, there are three ways in which sharks are um, able to reproduce. So there's viviparous, oviviparous, and ovoviviparous. They all essentially sound the same, but they all mean different things. Viviparous just means that they birth live young. Oviviparous means that they are egg laying. Here are some pictures of some shark eggs here. You can see that they're all different shapes and sizes um, and look really cool. And then oviviparous, it just means that they birth living young, but they start out as eggs inside the womb and then they hatch within the womb. One really cool reproduction fact about sharks, um, in particular the sa uh, sand tiger shark, they have two uteruses and Within each uterus, a bunch of pups um, grow in there, but only two pups are born from each, from one from each uterus each. And the reason for that is because while they're growing and becoming bigger, the most dominant shark in each uterus um, will actually eat um, all the other pups that are living with it. So it's a really early way of coming to terms with natural selection, um, but it's also just a really interesting fun fact about sand tiger sharks. 
And now we're gonna go into our species. So the nurse shark. Uh, the nurse shark is probably one of our most commonly seen uh, sharks around here. Um, even though they might look small, they get up to 250 pounds or nine feet in length, which is pretty large compared to some of the ones that I've at least seen here. Um, they're oviviparous, uh, which means that they have the eggs within them and then they birth live young. You can usually find them on the coastal zone uh, in sand or even under ledges. When I go diving, I'll always be looking for these little nurse sharks hiding under rocks or under coral heads, uh, just hanging around. And then they also have a 25 year lifespan, which is pretty long. So these guys, if you want to identify them in the wild, they really have this really soft gray brown uh, color to them. And they kind of have these eyes that kind of just look white, as you can kind of see in that bottom picture there. But other ways you can identify them is that they have uh, a really small mouth with whiskers. So you can see up there, those little whiskers going about. They also have a dorsal fins that are really similar in size. So those two dorsal fins um, are almost the same size. And then lastly, their caudal fin either has no lobe or a really small lobe. And when I say this, um, I just mean that bottom part of their caudal fin doesn't extend out. So it's just mostly the top part. Our next shark is the lemon shark. So these guys are another one that we see pretty often here on Andros. The lemon shark hunts against the sandy sea floor. So if you guys saw Will's PowerPoint last week on bonefish, he'll usually see lemon sharks pretty often while he's out in the flats. They like to hang out in that really shallow area and blend in with the sand, so which is why they have that yellowy brown, really pretty color to them, which is why they're called the lemon shark. They have that yellow tint to them. They also don't have very good eyesight. Um, so with their poor eyesight, they primarily focus on their ampullae of Lorenzini to be able to find uh, what they want to eat um, and navigate using that. You can also find them in mangroves. So in that bottom photo there, you can see that little nurse shark, or sorry, lemon shark hanging around in the mangroves. They do some cool shark yoga and can bend really well and dip in and out of those mangrove roots. Um, and it's also a really good place for them to grow up. So usually you'll find baby lemon sharks there. Um, it's almost like a little nursery for them to be really protected. They are viviparous. Um, and they can get five to eight feet. Usually the ones that we see here um, are on the smaller side, but we do see some larger ones in a little bit of deeper water. Their diet is slow moving prey. Um, so they go for things like um, parrotfish and other crustaceans um, and things like that. And they're also pretty social animals. So they like to hang out with other lemon sharks or other fish as well. Our next shark is the Caribbean reef shark. So these guys are your typical looking shark. Um, and you, we usually see them when we're diving. Um, and these guys have a really cool attack mechanism that's a little different than most sharks and most animals in general. So these guys, you have your fish, the shark is swimming towards the fish and he'll swim and he'll swim and he'll swim past the fish, turn around, pass the fish a second time, and that fish thinks that uh, they're gonna get attacked that second time as that shark just turned around, but they'll pass them. And then they'll turn around quickly on that third time and then attack them. Um, this attack mechanism um, kind of allows them to offset their prey um, and to be able to catch them. They are viviparous. Uh, their location uh, in the water is usually on coral reefs. As I said, we usually see them diving, uh, but you won't find them deeper than 30 meters. Um, and if anything, you're gonna find them in shallower places than that. They're usually on an eight foot average in length. Um, they usually will see them at like four feet here. Um, eight foot is on the bigger side. And then their diet are bony fish, large crustaceans and other elasmobranchs. And when we say other elasmobranchs, that's most likely just other rays. Our next shark is the black tip reef shark. Um, these guys kind of look like your Caribbean reef shark, but the difference between them um, is that they have that black tip on the top of their dorsal fin um, and on other 
types of their fins. There are other reef sharks that are called their name based on the tip color of their dorsal fin. So there's like the white tip reef shark. Um, but today we're just going to focus on the black tip reef shark. These guys are viviparous. They have a 13 year lifespan um, in their home body. So this is a really interesting fact about black tip reef sharks. Uh, they like to stay near their home. So they have a home range of about 0.21 square miles, which is really small and is actually the smallest of any shark species. So if you see a black tip reef shark, that just means that they're uh, probably going to be near their homes. Their diet consists of mostly mullets, uh, jacks, and wrasses. Um, and these guys will actually sometimes even hunt together or with other fish and they'll herd them together into these little schools and then attack so that um, they have a better chance of getting their fish. Our next shark, we are getting a little bigger here. Uh, we have our tiger shark. So our tiger shark has that really distinct tiger stripe pattern on them. And these tiger stripe patterns on them um, can be seen since uh, once they are born. And then as they get bigger and bigger, they get a little bit more faded, but they're always just kind of faintly there. So they have that really distinct pattern. And you can also kind of see on their dorsal fit as well, especially in that top photo there. They have a spiracle behind their eye. The spiracle behind their eye um, is actually a special kind of gill slits. So sh these sharks still have gill slits. You can see it in both photos that they have five sets of gill slits. Um, but this kind of gill slit sort of thing behind their eye um, just brings a supply of oxygen directly to their eyes in the brain of the shark. They are also nicknamed the garbage trucks of the ocean. So they will eat probably anything that is in their sight. Um, they really like to eat strange things like sheep and goats if they have the option to. Um, they've also been found to have plastic bottles, beer bottles, clothing, and even license plates in their stomach. Um, this is found after if they find them dead and cut them open to do like an autopsy sort of thing. Um, but yeah, they'll eat absolutely anything that's in front of them. These guys are over the, the Paris, which just means that they have the little eggs inside of them and then they still birth live young. They also get up to 10 to 16 feet. So these guys are huge. Um, they live usually in deeper waters. Um, and with their size comes a really large pounds. Um, so they are 800 to 1,000 pounds, which is really heavy. And these guys eat sea turtle, sharks, squid, and jellies. So these guys have teeth that are really coarsely serrated. Um, and this design allows them to saw through sea turtle shells which is pretty impressive. If you've ever touched a sea turtle shell, those things are pretty hard. Uh, so it's impressive that they're able to just, like saw through them. Uh, but they also eat other sharks, squid, and jellies, like I was saying. And they've also been known to eat dolphins. Our next shark are bull sharks. So these bull sharks kind of look like your reef shark, but they're a little chubbier, uh, a little fatter, a little bit more barrel shaped. They have a really unique attack method as well. Uh, they take their the, the tip of their nose, and the reason why they're called bull sharks is because of their attack method. So they hit their prey with their nose and then go and munch on whatever they just hit. Um, and this is really similar to bulls when they use their head. These guys are special, as I said earlier. Uh, they're able to go in between salt and fresh water. So we actually have bull sharks here on Andrus. Uh, we've seen them swimming up the creek, up Stafford Creek, um, and hanging out, especially at night. We think that they come and just hang out um, at nighttime up there and then go out beyond the reef during the day. They also go and have their pups up in the salt water, uh, typically in creeks as well. Um, it's just a more um, secluded place that's really safe for their pups to grow, out, grow up before they go out into the big ocean. So their location in shore waters and reefs, as I was just saying. Um, personally, we haven't seen any out uh, on the boats, but we've definitely seen them in the creek. So, and we've seen them swim in from the ocean into the creek. So we know that they're out there, probably in deeper water. As I said, their pups are born in fresh water and then come in to the salt water later in their life. 
their diet are again bigger things than our other sharks so kind of similar to the tiger shark that we were just talking about uh, the other fish turtles dolphins crustaceans birds they can get them um, and other sharks and with their diet they have a lot of teeth so they can have up to 530 teeth at a time they have many rows of teeth and um, with that they also lose a lot of teeth so they're always coming in and building a new row of teeth um, and they use all these teeth to munch down on all those big animals and our last shark that we're going to talk about today is the hammerhead so there's a local hammerhead um, on Andros, his name is the Channel Master. Haven't seen him yet. I wish to see him some point. Um, they saw him last summer off Pigeon Key. Um, he's a really big hammerhead. He's up to 14 feet. Um, again, I would love to see him. But hammerheads have this really distinct hammerhead shape. Um, Sepia follows um, with eyes on each side. They have a high number of ampullae of Lorenzini. So again, with this head shape, they have all these ampullae of Lorenzini that are scattered around their head. And with that, they're able to navigate really, really well on um, what they want to eat. So that fish is on the left side. They can sense it more on their left side and are able to turn over that way. And same with the other direction as well. Their location um, is on the shore or offshore up to 300 meters in depth. So I was saying, uh, they've seen the local hammerhead here at about uh, at Pigeon Key, um, but they usually hang out in deeper waters. It's also been spotted at a local dive site here. If you've seen any of the classic hammerhead school photos um, in the Galapagos, then you know that they swim in schools as well. Again, absolutely magnificent if you're lucky enough to see one. And they have almost 360 degree vision because of their eyeballs being on the side of their head, um, which gives them a really good chance to be able to go and hunt all of their prey. Um, and they also have a pretty aggressive mating behavior. Um, and the male usually viciously attacks the female until she agrees to mate with him. Um, so yeah, so that's our last shark for today. But now we're gonna go into skates and raids. Um, for the purpose of what we see here on Andros, we're gonna mostly focus on rays, but we'll also tell you the difference between skates and rays. Um, but first, difference between sharks and rays and skates is that sharks have that more fish looking like body, and then the rays and skates, as you can see here, are flat and paper thin almost. They also have a different placement of their gill slits. So rays and skates still have gill slits, but instead of them being on the side like sharks, they instead have it on the bottom and yeah then the difference between rays and skates is that ray rays have one big sort of shape to them a big diamond shape on the other hand a skate has two kind of shapes to them so they have the main shape that i'm pointing to there and then right below it it kind of fades off into another lobe so to say the other main difference is that one has a barb and one does not so rays all have barbs on them, which they can use to stab and poke someone, and then skates do not have those barbs. Now we'll go into some species of rays that are here. So our first one is the most common. We have the southern stingray. They can get really large. Um, they come in all shapes and sizes, but they have a diamond shape that's a little bit more round than you would say your eagle ray. Um, and they camouflage, them, camouflage themselves into the sand by flapping up sand up above their bodies, like you can see in that first photo up there, um, and just hang out there. So sometimes when you're snorkeling, you'll be swimming around and you'll just see two little eyeballs uh, and then realize that there's a big old southern stingray hanging out there. Their reproduction is over the terrace, which means that they have little eggs inside them and then bird live young. They have a gestation period of about three to eight months with two to 10 pups being born at a time. Um, and you can kind of see that barb on them, um, but that barb is only going to be used if you were to go and try to like pull their tail or go bother them or poke them. I personally wouldn't want to be poked, um, so I don't blame them for that. Our next ray is our spotted eagle ray. So these guys are really pretty. 
Um, they have two sort of triangle shapes to them um, of their fins, and they have that really distinct polka dotted body to them on top. Um, a really key feature to them too is that they have um, a dental plate with single, a single series of large teeth. And they use this to be able to crunch up crustaceans and bivalves um, and other things that have shells that they would like to eat. These guys can be seen jumping out of the water. Uh, recently, we've seen some jumping out of the water at Blue Hole Key, which is really absolutely amazing to see. These guys also sometimes will be swimming around in groups. So you can see probably 10 spotted eagle rays migrating at the same time all together, which again is beautiful to see. It's happening around here. Uh, the location of these guys along the ocean coast usually um, in warmer waters. Um, you'll find them on reefs, but you'll also find them in shallower areas here. We've seen them right off the beach uh, at Fort Farr Field Station. They can get up to four feet to six, uh, 6.5 feet, max being eight feet, which is really, really large. Um, pretty sure the ones at Blue Hole Key are almost that large. And that is our spotted eagle ray. Next, we have a Caribbean whiptail ray. So these guys were actually recently rediscovered species in the Bahamas. Uh, the last listed sighting was in 1968 near Grand Exuma Island. Uh, then nothing was found after 2015. Uh, where a wide Bahamas capture and recapture and DNA study in three of the Pamian Islands uh, was done, which then registered the presence and actually evi um, put evidence on certain behavior traits within the Caribbean whiptail. These guys are more circular shaped. They kind of look like your southern stingray, but they're on the smaller side um, and they're more circular and a little bit lighter in color. In the 2015 study, they found that they prefer more protected areas than th southern stingrays, um, and they are also usually found further up creeks, which might be the reason why they weren't found in between that really long period. Um, and also might have been because of things like bycatch and them being hunted as a food source uh, for meat, gelatin, and oil. And then our last ray is the yellow spotted ray. I think these guys right after eagle rays are one of my favorite because they're really cute. Um, they are about the size of a dinner plate. So they're really circular um, and they have this color to them that's yellow and brown and polka dotted. And then they have their tiny little tails and their tails are a little different than some of our other rays we've talked about. If you can see in that really big photo, they have um, a little bit of a caudal fin so that helps them swim around. These guys we've seen at a place that we call the pool, which is our uh, confined open water training site. And so you have to make sure that you're not going to step on any. But uh, we'll see them there. They like muddy places or places in seagrass, um, anywhere where they can camouflage on the bottom. So why are sharks important? So I think this is probably the most important thing to take away from this PowerPoint. Um, sharks have been swimming around the oceans for more than 400 million years. Um, that's older than dinosaurs, and it's pretty impressive that they have lived through so many catastrophic events of dinosaurs being extinct and a lot of other things being extinct. So I'm pretty impressed with them, uh, but currently we are killing sharks at a rate of 100 million sharks per year in commercial fisheries. Uh, this market includes fins, meat, skin, liver, liver oil, and jaws. Um, and but why does this matter? Um, sharks take a long time to sexually uh, mature and also to grow. And as I was saying early, earlier, they don't reproduce at a big number like some of our other sharks. Um, so when we catch them at such a high rate, they're not able to reproduce to catch up in any way like some other fish. So why are sharks important though? Sharks are great for the economy. So they're not great for the economy in terms of killing them and selling parts of their body. They're great for the economy in terms of tourism. Um, people will pay lots of money to go to come down here and see a live shark in the water, either through diving or through snorkeling. They keep our reefs functioning properly. Um, so they're part of the big food web. If we were to kill them out, then it would disrupt the whole ecosystem. They are also, quote unquote, better dead than alive. Um, yes, that's true. 
but for some numbers behind that, um, it restart that you see here when your snorkeling can be worth up to $1.9 million, which is huge, um, and that's in its lifetime. Meanwhile, a dead shark is only worth about $108, uh, and that's in US. So they're worth a lot more alive, um, which is why we shouldn't be killing them. Losing sharks, as I was saying earlier, to keep our reefs functioning, it could cause a top-down effect. So sharks are apex predators. If you were to kill that shark off, let's say all sharks were to go extinct, it really messed up the ecosystem. Other species would really grow in numbers, or other species, and then other species would dwindle, and it would totally offset everything. So to keep our reefs alive, we also need sharks. But also, why are we killing these sharks? So chances of a shark attack. Most people, the reason why they feel almost okay to kill them is because they're scared. They seem like these big scary creatures with their big shark teeth um, and that they are going to attack you. And there are stories of shark attacks, but there are a lot more other ways to die than a shark attack and more probable cases. Um, some more realistic than others. Um, as you can see in the infographic, the flu, a car accident, a fall, a lightning strike, or even an asteroid. Um, and then a little bit more obscure, but still more likely, is falling coconuts. We have falling coconuts here all the time. Um, falling out of bed, crushed by, crushed by a vending machine, struck by lightning, um, and left-hand users using right-handed equipment, because there isn't a lot of left-hand equipment for those people. Um, but with that said, uh, we are still killing sharks. Our sharks are only killing us between five to 15 fatal shark attacks around the world for a year. Um, and meanwhile, we are killing 100 million sharks per year just for their fins, their meat, their jaws, skin and liver oil. Um, and we're killing them in really brutal ways. And then, um, but then who is more worried about the attacks? Should it be sharks or should it be humans? And in my opinion, sharks should be more afraid than we are. So sharks in the Bahamas. Um, sharks are a really big thing here in the Bahamas. If you've ever gone on Instagram and looked up the Bahamas, most likely a shark is going to show up. Um, in 2011, the Bahamas established a shark sanctuary in all territorial waters. This just means that it is illegal to fish for sharks with any type of gear. So you can't go and catch them with your bare hands and you can't go and catch them um, in any sort of way. Um, with this, uh, the Bahamas are protecting more than 40 different shark species that are here, uh, which is actually pretty awesome. Um, and the reason why they did this is because this is one of the biggest shark diving industries in the world. Uh, people come down here just to go dive with sharks and to go snorkel with sharks and pay lots of money to do that. Um, and it actually brings in $114 million a year, which is a big part of money and the Bahamas relies a lot on tourism. So sharks are in danger, but what can you do to, to, to help protect sharks? Um, you can choose more sustainable seafood so that you reduce the amount of bycatch. You can reduce the demand in shark fin trade. Uh, this also includes not the shark fin trade, but also things like getting a necklace with a shark tooth on it. Most places that shark tooth is actually from a shark that was killed and not just a shark tooth that was found on the beach. And then also bring awareness to sharks to people that may not know. Um, personally, this is one of my favorite things to do. Um, and also just be aware of the fact that we go into the ocean um, and go and hang out with them, but that's their home. Um, so we're coming into the, their home and we should be respectful of their home. So that's our presentation for today. I hope you guys all liked it. I think Kosh is going to share some questions with me. Yeah. Uh, so, nice. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thanks to everyone who said we're doing a good job. <laughs> and said hi. Um, what kind of sharks do you usually see around Forfar? So thanks, Elizabeth. Um, sharks that we usually see around Forfar 
are reef sharks and lemon sharks and nurse sharks. Um, we'll see lemon sharks just hanging out. We'll hang out on the veranda and just look out into the ocean um, and see little lemon sharks swimming around. Um, as I was saying, we see our nurse sharks usually while we're snorkeling, we'll look under some ledges, especially at Rat Key, uh, which is a little blue hole. You can swim down into the blue hole and look for little nurse sharks hanging around. Um, and then the reef sharks we'll usually see during our dives, which is really cool. Um, what is the most, oh yeah, most common shark that people see, which attacks people the most and which gets eaten most for the food industry? So the sharks that attack the most are usually the bigger sharks um, who are known as the more aggressive ones. Uh, those would be your bull sharks and your tiger sharks um, and also your great whites. A lot of that, um, I didn't say this in my PowerPoint, but a lot of it is mostly because everything when you're in the water, everything that a shark senses leads to you being fish or anything that they would like to eat until they bite into you. Um, shark attacks usually are just one bite and then the shark leaves. They're like, ew, that's gross. Um, I don't want to be eating this skinny little human. So I'm going to swim away. Um, and then the people will just bleed out instead. Uh, so that's why most people die from shark attacks. Um, and those are sharks that are usually blamed for shark attacks. Um, which sharks get eaten most in the food industry? I couldn't tell you, so to say, um, any sh sort of sharks that can be found. Um, yeah, usually the bigger ones, um, and especially because they have those big fins, which people like to have for shark fin soup. Um, and they have those bigger, bigger uh, liver oils, um, which is really valuable and uh, people want for different medicines and things. Which is the biggest shark and which is the smallest shark? I can tell you the biggest shark and also my favorite shark is the whale shark. Um, they're like the size of a school bus um, and they're absolutely beautiful. They're blue and have um, white polka dots on them. So that's the biggest shark. The smallest shark is probably the cookie cutter shark. Um, there might be someone that beats it. A cookie cutter shark is a deep ocean shark um, and they live deep in the waters. Um, and they're called the cookie cutter shark because they are almost like a cookie cutter and will put perfect circles and seals um, and other an animals, blubbers, um, kind of like a cookie cutter. How big is the biggest stingray? I do not know this on top of my head, um, but I wish I knew. They get pretty large here. Um, they're probably as large as some of our students, if not me. Um, thank you for all the shout outs. Can you, can you say again what we can do to prevent shark death? Okay, awesome. Thank you, Caitlin. Um, so to prevent shark death, um, you can choose a more sustainable seafood uh, to reduce the amount of bycatch. So bycatch is um, sharks accidentally getting caught in fishing nets. Um, so fishermen will set out these really big nets in the ocean and just drag those nets sometimes in the ocean, in the open ocean or even on the bottom floor um, in a trawling method and sharks accidentally get caught in there and a lot of other sorts of bycatch. So if you choose a more sustainable seafood, um, there is a website that we can link for you um, that is would be able to tell you more sustainable seafood places and fish as well. Um, you can also just educate people, um, educate yourself as well, um, reduce the, the demand of shark fin trade, and also um, things like don't buy shark fin soup or don't buy shark fins or don't buy those little necklaces that have shark teeth on them. They're most likely from um, sharks that have been killed on purpose. Do animal rescue organizations rescue sharks that get injured? I am sure there are some out there, but I am not aware. That actually be a really cool thing to look into. I'm gonna have to look into that myself. Maybe you can um, comment that later. Um, Nice. I think those are all our questions today. Thank you, everyone who has um, liked it and watched today. We really appreciate it. Um, 
Next week, we are going to have a talk about geology of Andros, and Haley, who is another environmental educator, will be talking about that. If you have any more questions, um, you can respond in our comment section here and go about that, and we can respond later. Oh, what I studied in college. Sorry, there's another question. What did I study in college to become, oh, a scientist studying sharks and rays? Um, so I actually studied environmental studies, so I have a Bachelor of Arts, um, and I studied at Hobart and William Smith Colleges. Um, my passion for sharks and oceans and rays and everything came from diving, which I feel very lucky to have been able to do. Um, and so that's where my big passion for them came from. Um, and I was very lucky to go study some sharks as well. Um, and so yeah, I just have a big passion for them. Uh, so thank you. I think we're going to end here and then we'll respond back with any more questions that come about.